Welcome to the World of McHale's Navy, a classic television series from 1962 that brings laughter, surprises, and heartfelt moments. This show takes us on a journey with Lieutenant Commander McHale and his mischievous crew as they navigate the waters of World War II with wit and humor. Their adventures are filled with funny situations, shocking twists, and moments that might just tug at your heartstrings. While I don't have personal experiences, many viewers have found inspiration in the show's ability to turn the serious backdrop of war into a source of laughter and camaraderie. The series stands out for its timeless humor and the strong bonds between characters' qualities that continue to draw people to it even after many years. Now we'd love to hear from you. What is your most memorable moment or experience with McHale's Navy? Your stories and memories are important to us, so please share them in the comments below. Keep watching for more surprising facts and touching stories from this beloved series. Aim for me, Admiral. I, did, I told you they're crazy about me. <laughs> we sure are, sir. Yes, sir. The television series, McHale's Navy, while set against the backdrop of World War II, presents a comedic take on the wartime experiences of the crew of PT-73. The series follows the misadventures of the crew, led by Lieutenant Commander McHale, portrayed by Ernest Borgnine, who often finds themselves at odds with the base commander and town military governor. Despite the serious setting, the show maintains a light-hearted tone, focusing on the humorous schemes and antics of McHale and his crew rather than the darker aspects of the war. The show's humor is driven by the performances of actors such as Joe Flynn and Tim Conway, who bring a unique comedic energy to their roles. While some viewers may find the portrayal of the crew as carefree and nonchalant during a time of conflict to be a point of contention, the series remains a beloved classic for its entertaining and humorous approach to storytelling. Tommy called me a disgrace! I heard, I heard! Captain, they're taking their jeep, tell them all- Ernest Borgnine, a familiar face on screen, gained significant recognition for his lead role in a popular naval-themed television show. Off-screen, his personal life saw dramatic turns, notably his brief marriage to Broadway star Ethel Merman, which ended after just over a month. The union, overshadowed by Borgnine's rising fame, faced challenges from the start, leading to a swift separation. Meanwhile, Carl Ballantine, another cast member, was known for his distinctive appearance, often accentuated by the use of toupees during filming. Borgnine's career continued to flourish, and he found long-lasting love in his subsequent marriages, while Merman chose to remain single, marking their short-lived marriage with a symbolic blank page in her memoirs. I think your ideal work, Skip. Well, it better... <laughs> Here, let me help you, Captain. No, no, that's all right, boy. I got that. I got that. In 2007, fans of the classic show were treated to a special reunion video featuring Ernest Borgnine, Tim Conway, Carl Ballantine, Edson Stroll, and Bob Hastings. This release marked a rare occasion, as it was the only extra included with the DVD sets. The passing of Tim Conway on May 14, 2019, was a significant loss for the entertainment community. More recently, the death of Yasho Yoda on January 13, 2023, left John Wright as the last living cast member. Reflecting on the show's history, Ernest Borgnine's role as a U.S. Navy officer mirrored his real-life military experience. Before his acting career, Borgnine served as a Navy non-commissioned officer aboard the USS Life, a patrol vessel active during World War II. I want the truth. I want the whole absolute Sunday school trip. In the midst of war, Captain Wallace B. Binghampton earned the moniker Old Lead Bottom due to an injury on his posterior. The crew under Lieutenant Commander McHale had a unique method for doing laundry. They would place their clothes in a perforated barrel, add soap, and tow it behind their patrol boat for a thorough wash. The patrol boat portrayed in the series, number PT-73, had an interesting history. Originally a 72-foot Vosper motor torpedo boat intended for the Soviet Union, it never saw combat and was later acquired by Howard Hughes. After its brief stint as a chase boat for the Spruce Goose, it was sold to Universal Pictures and modified for the show, including the addition of non-authentic machine gun turrets. Filming for the crew scenes took place on a full-scale replica on a soundstage. The vessel's final days were not as glorious. It ended up as a sport fishing boat before being destroyed in a storm. The actual PT-73, a 78-foot Higgins boat, met a similar fate during the war, destroyed to prevent capture. The 
belly, please. I've got a nervous stomach. I got nervous everything. Don't shoot my anything. Look. In the midst of the Pacific Theater, the crew often found respite in New Caledonia, a favored stop for rest and recreation. The character ends. Charles Parker frequently mentioned his hometown of Chagrin Falls, Ohio, a detail that mirrored the real-life upbringing of actor Tim Conway. Additionally, the series subtly nodded to historical events with references to an unnamed commander of torpedo boat PT-109, an allusion to John F. Kennedy's World War II service. I'm afraid Binghamton gave you the zinger again. No, that no good. Oh, we got it. In the midst of war's chaos, Captain Wallace B. Binghamton faced his own personal battle with goldenrod allergies. Meanwhile, the airwaves carried the voice of an English-speaking woman, dubbed Nip and Nancy by the crew, echoing the real-life broadcasts of Ivatagari, known as Tokyo Rose. Off-screen, Joe Flynn left a lasting impression through his roles in Disney films and as the memorable Captain Binghamton. Boy, this sure seems like a waste of good liquor to me. I guess In the show's early episodes, viewers got to know George Christie Christopher's wife as Gloria. However, as the series progressed, her name was unexpectedly changed to Ruth. Among the cast, John Wright stands out as the sole remaining regular cast member alive today. Within the crew, Happy Haynes held a unique position as the only member without a rating, while his comrades held ranks as first and second class petty officers. Heard every time. I lost my marble. Hey, anybody seen the Skips Marbles? Okay, now let's spread out. Let In the midst of the show's comedic escapades, viewers learned that the character known as Christy Christopher actually goes by the first name George, adding a touch of personal detail to the narrative ends. Charles Parker often refers to his pet frog, initially named Albert, but in a twist of continuity, the amphibian's name later becomes David. Furthermore, the character Willie Moss is introduced as a native of Tennessee, grounding his backstory in a specific American locale. These elements serve to add depth and relatability to the characters, enriching the show's dynamic. 30 days. Now get out of here before your hat starts shedding on my floor. Before joining the war effort, Captain Wallace Beebinghampton was known for managing a yacht club on Long Island Sound and editing a yachting magazine. His connection to the sea is evident, even seen sporting a San Diego Yacht Club sweatshirt in one episode. The show's PT-73, a key element of the series, made a cameo in another show, Emergency, Quicker Than the Eye, where it was part of a dramatic rescue after an accident on a movie studio lot. Meanwhile, Radio Man Willie Moss took on the additional role of the cruise distiller, using makeshift parts to produce whiskey, humorously claiming it had been aging all day. These snippets offer a glimpse into the lives and times of the characters reflecting their pre-war occupations, the iconic PT-73, and the crew's resourcefulness and camaraderie. Where is your mustache, huh? <laughs> In the comedic landscape of a classic show, the character of a scheming mayor, Mario Legato, stands out as he consistently attempts to extract money from Captain Wallace B. Binghamton. Portrayed by Jay Novello, Lugato's antics add a layer of humor to the series. Another character, known as Happy Haynes, is revealed to have the first name Joseph, adding depth to his on-screen persona. Behind the scenes, Gavin McLeod faced personal challenges, leading to his departure from the show in 1964 to seek help for alcoholism, as advised by his family and close friend Robert Blake. Concurrently, McLeod embarked on a new journey with the film The Sand Pebbles, released in 1966. In the midst of comedic escapades and naval antics, the character known as Tinkerbell was actually Harrison Bell by birth. Among the cast, two characters stood out for their personal lives off-screen Captain Binghampton and Quartermaster Christy Christopher, both of whom were married, with Christy being the sole parent on the show. Off the screen, Ernest Borgnine, who brought laughter to many homes, was recognized for his real-life naval service. On October 15, 2004, he was honored as an US Navy Chief Petty Officer, a nod to his 10-year ten tenure in the Navy, which concluded in 1945 as a gunner's mate first class. Yes, Fuji can teach me all the Japanese I need to know. What do I have to say, Fuji? When they call your name. In the world of classic television, the set of a popular show often becomes a character in its own right. 
Such was the case with the naval base of Teratupa, which was not just a backdrop, but a living part of the show's universe. Constructed on Universal Studios' back lot, this set remained a tangible piece of history, welcoming visitors on studio tours long after the series concluded. In a nod to the show's legacy, the PT-73 boat made a cameo appearance in an episode of Columbo, linking two distinct television worlds. Adding to the authenticity of the show, Lester Gruber's character brought a touch of New York to the Pacific, with his roots firmly planted in Brooklyn. These elements combined to create a show that was more than just its script. It was a carefully crafted environment that resonated with audiences and left a lasting impression on television history. When that senator gets here, we're goners. You know, why does everything have to happen to us? I don't know. In the midst of war's chaos, a unique camaraderie forms among the crew of a certain patrol torpedo boat, where the leader affectionately earns the nickname Uncle Dudley from his loyal team. The commanding officer overseeing their operations, however, views them less fondly, dubbing them a bunch of pirates for their unconventional antics. Meanwhile, the authority they answer to holds the distinguished rank of Rear Admiral, guiding their naval adventures with a firm hand. This dynamic shapes their daily life, weaving a story of humor and hierarchy on the high seas. Has filched the turkeys right out of my loyal officers' mouths and to be in In the midst of laughter and antics on the set, a piece of history was present in the form of a PT boat, previously owned by Howard Hughes. This very boat played a role in aviation history, serving as a photographic chase boat for the Spruce Goose's only flight. After serving in the United States Navy, Ernest Borgnine found himself at a crossroads, returning to his family home without immediate prospects. On screen, the character Mikhail showed a unique familiarity with ends. Charles Parker, initially calling him Charlie before later episodes had him switch to Chuck, a term of endearment not used by the rest of the crew. I can't smell when you know like it. Oh, I can't, can I? Oh, see, I like the smell of this. I'm going to declare war. From now on, every dog in this town has... In the scenic Italian town of Voltafiore, the crew led by Mikhail was stationed, yet none of them, including the commanding officer himself, donned the then-popular garrison cap. Ernest Borgnine, who played Mikhail, found himself absent from the 1965 sequel despite his character's popularity and the original film's success. The decision, never fully explained to Borgnine, was speculated to be a cost-saving measure by Universal and producer Edward Montagny, aiming to promote Joe Flynn and Tim Conway as a new leading duo. Borgnine quickly moved past this, taking a significant role in The Flight of the Phoenix, continuing in the show's final season, and years later, being the sole original cast member to return in the 1997 film. He's Binghamton's guest, don't you see? He invited her. Look, why don't you go into my shack and uh, listen to the radio, huh? Before his turn to acting, Ernest Borgnine served a decade in the United States Navy, nearly making it his career until his mother persuaded him otherwise. And the show ends. Charles Parker frequently mentioned his mother, but seldom his father. A notable shift occurred in the final season when Lieutenant CM Dr. Quentin McHale and his crew, along with Captain Wallace B. Binghampton and Lieutenant Elroy Carpenter, were relocated from the Pacific to the European theater, a move that was highly uncommon in actual military practice. Well, I'll tell you. Somehow I feel an attack of, um, ooh, my old berry. In the midst of comedic escapades, the crew often found themselves in humorous situations where disguises were necessary. On such occasions, Tinker or Mr. Parker would be seen donning a dress, adding a twist to their plans. At the heart of the show was Ernest Borgnine, who, at the age of 45, brought life to the central character. His casting was a deliberate choice, reflecting the producer's vision for the show's lead. Borgnine's portrayal became a defining element of the series, contributing significantly to its humor and heart. Change Christmas card. <laughs> well, then you better start acting lovable. Let me move him out of that pest hole and give him... In the comedic landscape of the early 1960s, a television show depicted the adventures of a mischievous naval crew during World War II. The adversaries, soldiers from Japan, were consistently labeled with the derogatory term nips, reflecting the era's less sensitive cultural norms. Among the ensemble cast, Carl Ballantine stood out for his portrayal of Lester Gruber, a crafty sailor aboard the PT-73. His performance alongside lead actors Ernest Borgnine and Tim Conway left a lasting impression on audiences. The show often dramatized naval combat with exaggerated flair, 
Enemy submarines were routinely destroyed in a spectacular fashion, either erupting into flames upon torpedo impact or surfacing only to be shattered by a depth charge. In the world of naval comedy, the rank of a PT boat captain typically did not extend beyond lieutenant. However, the character McHale was an exception, holding a higher staff rank. This departure from the norm added a unique twist to the show's dynamic. The crew's unconventional use of their vessel, the PT-73, for leisure activities like water skiing, further highlighted their carefree and rebellious spirit. Behind the scenes, the camaraderie was just as strong, with actors Tim Conway and Ernest Borgnine sharing a great rapport both during filming and in their personal time, reflecting the show's overall atmosphere of teamwork and friendship. Tim Conway, recognized for his portrayal of Ensign Charles Parker, shared a positive working relationship with co-star Ernest Borgnine. Their camaraderie was evident off-screen as well, contributing to the show's dynamic. Ernest Borgnine, before his acting career, dedicated a decade to serving in the United States Navy. His military service during World War II and subsequent support of naval forces earned him the honorary title of Chief Petty Officer, reflecting his deep ties with the naval community. Elena! <laughs> What do you do with my gal, Yankee? Ernest Borgnine joined a distinguished group of actors leading their own shows when he took on the role of a crafty PT boat commander. Alongside him, Carl Ballantine brought humor to the screen, though audiences may not have known him by his birth name, Mayor Kessler. Despite its comedic legacy, the show was originally envisioned as a serious portrayal of military life. The shift from drama to comedy allowed for a lighter, more humorous exploration of naval operations during World War II. Who's having a celebration, Admiral? That's a phonograph. <laughs> now calm down, sir. Easy does it. There's a very simple... In the midst of war's chaos, the crew aboard the PT-73 faced unique challenges and responsibilities. Willie Moss, serving as both radio man and sonar man, played a crucial role in detecting enemy submarines, alerting his superior, Lieutenant Commander Quentin McHale, whenever threats surfaced. Uniformity was not strict among the crew. Ranks were displayed inconsistently, with some members donning them on the left sleeve while others on the right. Fans of the show might recognize the Voltafir set and the actual PT-73 boat, which made a cameo appearance in the town square during an episode of Adam-12 Hollywood Division, linking the two series in a subtle nod to television history. That's Shaw. All right, now you attack me. Come on. Don't worry. I'll take it easy on you. <laughs> In the crew, distinctiveness was marked not just by actions, but also by attire. Virgil, Christie, and Gruber distinguished themselves by wearing their rating patches on their right arm, while Willie and Tinker opted for the left. The show's authenticity was enhanced by Ernest Borgnine, who brought a touch of his heritage to his character by speaking Italian, mirroring his own linguistic abilities. The camaraderie among characters was evident through the nicknames they used, for instance, Lieutenant C.M. Dr. Quentin McHale's affectionate, yet informal reference to Lieutenant Elroy Carpenter as Carpy added a personal touch to their interactions. Hi. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you can start beating the sidewalks. You're fired. You can't fire. In the show's portrayal of military life, uniform details were often overlooked. Officers like Lieutenant Commander Quentin McHale were seen in dress khakis without any ribbons, which was not the case for certain high-ranking visitors in Italy, such as General Bronson and Colonel Douglas Harrigan, who displayed their ribbons. The inconsistency extended to Admiral Rogers, whose first name alternated between John and Bruce. Adding to the quirks, the sound effects for President Franklin D. Roosevelt's dog falla vary from a large to a small dog's bark despite the historical fact that Roosevelt had a diverse set of seven dogs, each with a distinct bark of its own. Mikhail, if you want me in there, it's because you don't want me out here. Oh, so out here's where I... In the world of early 1960s television, a show emerged that would leave a lasting impression on its audience. The character Captain Binghampton, known for his commanding presence, underwent a subtle change as the series progressed. Initially introduced as R.F. Binghampton, his middle name was later revealed to be Burton, aligning with his new full name, Wallace B. Binghampton. This alteration added depth to the character's identity. Tim Conway, a beloved actor from the show, 
had a memorable moment during a guest appearance on Subway Hero and 28. Portraying Bucky Bright, he was shown around the NBC office and pointed out a familiar face in a publicity photo. The image, taken from the very show that had cemented his fame, featured him among the cast, creating a moment of nostalgia and recognition for fans. Ernest Borgnine, the acclaimed actor who led the cast, shared a pivotal encounter that influenced his decision to join the show. Despite initial reluctance and a prestigious Oscar win for Marty under his belt, a chance interaction with a young candy seller sparked a realization. The boy's familiarity with television stars, yet inability to place Borgnine prompted the actor to reconsider the offer for the pilot. This decision ultimately led to Borgnine's most recognized role on television, proving that sometimes life's most significant opportunities come from the most unexpected encounters. Yeah? But last night, I faced a fate that was even above, above and beyond. In the midst of World War II's Pacific Theater, Lieutenant Commander Quentin McHale, hailing from Michigan, led a motley crew aboard the PT-73. The show often featured dramatic naval battles, with the destruction of Japanese submarines being a common sight. Notably, these explosive scenes were not originally filmed for the series, but were instead repurposed footage to add a sense of realism. The crew itself was a diverse group with varying ranks. Virgil, Tinker, and Christie held the position of first-class petty officers, while Gruber and Willie were second-class petty officers. Among them, Happy stood out as a seaman, contributing to the dynamic hierarchy aboard the vessel. Skipper's right. There's just so much pampering we freaks of nature can take. <laughs> That's all. Well, if you think I'm going to let you out... In the show's early episodes, viewers are greeted with a subtle nod to humor as the opening credits display flags representing letters in the NATO phonetic alphabet, specifically C, H, K, and L, which humorously suggests the word chuckle. Initially, the spotlight was solely on Ernest Borgnine, whose name was the only one featured during these credits. However, as the series progressed into its second season, Tim Conway and Joe Flynn joined him, receiving recognition alongside Borgnine. The camaraderie among the cast extended beyond their time on the show, with Borgnine and Conway later sharing the screen in separate episodes of the animated series SpongeBob SquarePants, marking a delightful reunion years after their original collaboration. Oh, yes, uh, take Ensign Whitfield over to the radio shack. Have a seat, Carpenter. Change those travel orders immediately. Yes, hurry, hurry, hurry. Come on, quick. In the midst of World War II, a crew aboard a PT boat had distinct roles that kept their operations running smoothly. George Christopher managed navigation as the quartermaster, while Harrison Bell ensured the engines ran as the motor machinist mate. Lester Gruber and Joseph Haynes handled the torpedoes. Willie Moss communicated with the base as the radio man, and Virgil Edwards was in charge of the weaponry. The show took an interesting turn when Ernest Borgnine portrayed two characters, including his cousin Giuseppe, adding a twist to the plot. Joe Flynn also showcased his versatility by playing both Captain Binghampton and Seaman Smoot in a memorable episode. Off screen, the bonds formed during the show's run proved strong, with Gavin McLeod maintaining a lifelong friendship with Borgnine long after their shared screen time ended. Hey, the skip's right, that's it. Now look, all we have to... Wait a minute, what could a 50... In the midst of comedic chaos and naval antics, Joe Flynn portrayed his character without the thick glasses he genuinely needed, opting for lens-free frames during indoor scenes to avoid light reflection. The show's unique blend of humor included Fuji Kobayashi's frequent use of oive, a Yiddish expression of dismay rather than Japanese becoming a signature catchphrase that even the crew echoed. Commanding Officer Quentin McHale had his own terms for his crew, calling them eight balls or schlockmeisters, while they affectionately addressed him as skipper or simply skip, highlighting the camaraderie and playful banter aboard their vessel. A real floating crap game. Knock it off, you guys. After we've done the job, we junk it. Oh, skip. Set against the backdrop of World War II, the crew at Teratuba Naval Base navigated the waters of both conflict and comedy. In an interesting twist of fate, Gavin McLeod, who appeared in the show, met Joyce Bulifan on set. Their connection was undeniable, and they eventually portrayed a married couple on another popular show, The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Despite the frequent screen time shared by Lieutenant Carpenter and Ensign Parker, their interactions were minimal, with very few exchanges between them, adding a unique dynamic to their on-screen relationship. Oh, hey, Fooch! 
You know how to operate that camera? Of course, Kipazan. I Japanese, remember? <laughs> In the midst of comedic escapades and naval antics, two characters stood out for their recurring roles, the Polynesian Chief Yurlu and the character known as Big Frenchie. Adding a layer of authenticity to the show, a scene depicting a submarine's destruction was not a product of studio effects, but actual footage from Operation Deadlight. This operation was the post-war disposal of German submarines by the U.S. Navy in the Atlantic. The specific submarine shown was a Titan IX U-boat, identifiable by the absence of a main gun forward of its sail. Among the cast, Gavin McLeod was notable for being the last of his fellow actors to pass away, leaving behind a legacy of laughter and memories from the show. You lost the torpedo? Yeah, but don't worry, I'll pay- Amidst the laughter and light-hearted adventures, the show experienced a somber moment off-screen. One of the original cast members, Yasha Yoda, who played the beloved character Fuji Kobayashi, faced a challenging reality. Despite his character's comedic presence, Yoda's personal journey was marked by the loss of his parents during World War II, a fact that stood in stark contrast to the jovial atmosphere of the series. This poignant detail from his life brought a depth to his role that resonated with many viewers, adding a layer of real-world gravity to the otherwise whimsical show. One of these to see what it can do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course. Yes, we, we know you.